constant conversation that we have is for every dollar we put in, how many dollars are we getting out? And how can we continue to grow the business from that perspective, knowing that every dollar has some sort of ad attributed uh, focus on it. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. When we think about the growth opportunity that exists online, it's hard to fully capture and understand it through social media, through marketplaces, organic community growth and advertising. There are so many ways to not just capture mind share, but carve a very distinct place for your brand online. An incredible example of this growth opportunity is liquid deaths. One would think a category like canned or bottled water wouldn't have much room for innovation, but the brand has truly shown what makes it stand out from all the rest, whether it be through awesome merch, unforgettable marketing campaigns, and truly relevant yet unexpected collaborations with pop culture icons. To really dig into the brand's approach, the lessons, the findings, and the opportunities that still exist, Claire Tassin of Morning Consult sat with Natalie Cotter, who plays a key role in the brand's digital presence and growth strategy. We are thrilled to be repurposing this conversation from the Retail Innovation Conference and Expo because not only do we love the brand, but we thought this session did an incredible job to showcase not just what sets the brand apart, but how other brands can take cues and clues from the Liquid Death Growth Playbook to apply to their business. Listen in, because if you're like me, you have been following this brand for a long time, so this insider's perspective is certainly valuable and incredibly entertaining. Listen in. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, So you've heard a little bit about us. My name is Claire Tassin. And I'm Natalie Cotter. Um, So Natalie, we've heard a little bit about you. Anything to add to your background and and how long you've been at Liquid Death? Why don't we start there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think while we're just getting going here, if you guys want to grab some water in the back corner, we did bring some still and sparkling. So um, if if this is your first time, it's just water. Uh, We also do have iced tea as well, but go ahead back there and try it out as we're getting going here. But yeah, for a little bit more background on me, I recently joined Liquid Death. Um, I head up all of our digital retail efforts. Um, Like it was said in the intro, I was in retail consulting prior to this, um, and then I did work for Walmart.com before that. So have really loved the retail space, and yeah, excited to to chat with you guys all today. Wonderful. And I just, A, I love how many of you are getting up to grab a water, so glad that was a good (laughs) idea to bring some. Um, I'm also just really excited to talk about the future of e-commerce and all of these exciting innovations happening with a water brand, not what you would typically think of as sort of a leader in the e-commerce space, but Natalie is here to teach us all quite a lot. So I've heard of Liquid Death. I was at a street festival in Chicago just this weekend, and this was the only water for sale in a 10 block radius, I think. So it certainly made its penetration in terms of concerts and events. But Natalie, we'd love to hear a little bit more. Just tell us about how the brand got started. I would love to hear a bit more where Liquid Death came from. Yeah, absolutely. So our founder and CEO, Mike, he you know, is a big amus- music junkie and a punk and metal music. And so he was going to all these different concerts, and he would see the various musicians. They'd have uh, energy drinks, actually, up on stage with them. And they were drinking a lot of energy drinks. Um, and you know, he kind of thought to himself, well, is that really energy drink? And he later found out that it was actually water. So these musicians were dumping out the energy drinks and filling them with water. And so it starts to just get your gears turning around, hey, is there a gap here for, you know, that could be filled with a different type of product? And, you know, he, t- he and the team really took a step back and looked at, okay, what does this landscape look like today? And, 
You look at you know, energy drinks, alcohol brands, junk foods, and they all have really fun marketing, right? They're, they do all the crazy fun marketing stunts, but then you look at some of the more healthier for you beverages and foods, and it's, it's not as fun and, and exciting. And so you know, he thought, there might be something here. And so what they did was they took $5,000 and said, let's test out this idea. So they created a video that they tested on social media to see what that traction looked like. And we were originally just targeting, you know, punk music lovers, metal music lovers, sports action junkies, and, and other people to that tune. And it, it took off, and it really went well. So from there, what we did was we went and fundraise a little bit of money to be able to go produce the water, produce the water, and then we started selling um, on dot-com and in some brick and mortar locations in, in 2020. And so since then, we started with just plain, spark, plain still water. About a year later in 2021, we expanded to sparkling, um, and then more recently to sparkling flavors and iced tea. And so that's a great little segue to talk a little bit more about iced tea. So we launched that earlier this year in March and it did a fun video and this will just kind of give you a taste of a bit about our brand and, and how we try to really be an entertainment and content led brand when it comes to interacting with our, with our humans. All right, let's take a look at this video. Iced tea, come on liquid death. This is like my grandma's energy drink. If anyone was feeling a little after lunch nap time, I hope that woke you up. Um, I also loved the tie back to the energy drink from that sort of the kickoff of the video, not your grandma's energy drink, I think we could call it, given the, the founding story that you shared with us. So starting with musicians, punk rockers, um, obviously there's been enormous growth in just a couple short years. Would love to hear a little bit more about how that audience has changed over time. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of that original assumption we had around those audiences with, you know, punk, punk music, um, metal music, and sports, sports action junk, junkies, that's kind of where we started and where we ran a lot of our social media campaigns at the onset to really target those shoppers. But what was really a big turning point for us was the distribution. So Whole Foods took us in brick and mortar in 2020. And you know, you're just getting so many more eyeballs being in a brick and mortar location. And so we really leaned into that. And as we're doing that, you start to kind of think of, okay, we know our low hanging fruit audience, but what's our next audience? And so kind of getting in front of all these people helped us understand what that really looked like. And one little nugget that sort of came to, came to, to fruition for us was that women were actually a, a top shopper of uh, liquid death products, which is interesting, right? Um, and so even taking that one step further in that audience, we found that it was actually moms who were loving our product, which we found out through customer support, people would write in and tell us that they loved liquid death because their kids were actually drinking water for the first time. <laughs> so cool. Um, and so, you know, we really started to lean into that and just have an open mind with who that, that audience could be for us. 
I think it's so interesting that like getting into stores is really what helped reveal an audience that you didn't, we weren't even thinking about it in the beginning. So at Morning Consult, we track brand data. We also just track consumer data. And one thing that I've noticed quite a lot is just how, it, you know, speaking of kids, Gen Z, I guess not really kids anymore, but even Gen Alpha, how younger consumers are just so much more open to new brands. And it did take having like a cool water brand to help moms keep their kids hydrated. The data you're looking at on the page is, or on the slide, is the share of consumers in each generation who say they actively look to try new brands across categories. So Gen Z is leading the charge in that teal box for apparel, um, for grocery, which is where we're kind of bucketing uh, liquid death today, as well as in the beauty category. A little bit less so in home, just because they're not quite there yet, um, and way down on personal electronics. But that's a story for the, the break after this session, if you're interested in that data point. But it is so interesting how that younger audience is just really craving novelty in so many of these brands that, um, that you've been able to serve as well, which is fantastic. Um, I'm curious, though, in terms of, like, you know, you, you started with, like, kind of the rock scene, and then you found the mom scene. What's, what's next? Yeah, so one thing that's next for us is um, we're actually going international. So we're going to market in the UK, and we've already started activating there in a few different ways. Um, so we are actually the headline sponsor for the Metallica Tour, which kicked off in Amsterdam back in April. Um, so activating at a lot of those concerts, as well as some other Live Nation events, as they're a, a good partner for us as well. So. International is a big thing for us this year, and yeah, just continuing to see you know, what those opportunities are for us to grow. Another little piece of the business that's become bigger and bigger in the more recent years is our merch business. So you know, we sell t-shirts and hats and really fun um, merch products, and we're, we, we really function that business more like a streetwear brand, where we're dropping one to two new SKUs a week, um, and so that's becoming a, a much more growing piece of the business as well. It's fascinating. I mean, you put so much investment into the logo and the branding, it makes sense that people would actually want to have that in a more permanent capacity than, than your can of water. So I mentioned when we at the top of the session that choosing to feature a water brand when we're talking about e-commerce growth feels a little bit counterintuitive, but I hope you're starting to see from what Natalie's been able to share that liquid death is sort of the exception to the rule in this space. I'm curious to hear, you know, you mentioned you started selling online as well as in a couple stores. The Whole Foods expansion was certainly a massive growth uh, point for the business. I'm, I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit more about like kind of the digital to omni-channel evolution that you've been going through? Yeah, absolutely. So we started um, primarily selling online online through Amazon. So at, at the you know sort of onset of the business that made up the majority, but as we started to evolve into this, this brand and we were winning over retail buyers to bring us in brick and mortar, you know, that's really evolved over the last few years. And up to today, you know, we're in about 90,000 doors across big box retailers, across convenience stores like 7-Eleven and Speedway, and then also natural chains. So like, you know, natural grocers and sprouts. Um, so that's really been an evolution for us as a business. And as we go forward, you know, we'll continue to, to, to get liquid death as close to your homes and into your everyday experiences as possible. It's interesting, too, because I think a lot of us post-2020 have a lot of questions about what is kind of that online grocery future, right? Like, is that sustainable? Was that a flash in the pan? What's the growth trajectory of that? Um, one thing that we track is how uh, the, the rate at which consumers are shopping online. So this comes from our daily brand tracking survey. Um, and going back to when we started asking this question in 2020, we can see that across generations, kind of as we go up in age, the purple becomes more saturated, that even you know, across all generations, that there is a steady interest in growing utilization of online grocery shopping. So those e-commerce channels are going to continue to become more and more important for you know, a lot of our CPG brands. Um, and I think especially of interest here is the millennial line. That's the one leading the curve on top. Again, it's, it's a lot of those moms who are trying to get that water in the house <laughs> and maybe don't want to take the kids to the grocery store at the same time. We're also seeing this across income groups. It's often uh, a lot of us think, a lot of the clients that I work with think of online grocery as predominantly a high income consumer thing. And you can see here that it is. That is the top line on this chart. But that rate of growth is extraordinarily similar across all of the income segments that, that we're tracking in this data. 
Um, so I think makes, you know, looking at that e-commerce as well as omnichannel in terms of that joint growth is uh, really fascinating, again, for a water brand. Um, we need to talk a little bit more about the packaging and the <laughs> logos and how, and how eye-catching they are. I understand how that can be really eye-catching in a store. Um, how is that helping to differentiate in the e-commerce sense, though? Great question, Claire. So, you know, I think as we think about the shopper journey and the first touch point that someone might have with Liquid Death, it could be at a Live Nation concert, it could be on social media from maybe a post of ours that went viral, it could be on Amazon, it could be in a brick and mortar store. And so I think one thing for us, and you know, we'll get into this a, a bit more here in the coming uh, minutes, but we're a very entertainment led brand, right? So how do we continue that sort of entertainment and, and just, piece of our DNA throughout that shopper journey. So it starts when they first interact with our brand, but then if they're in a brick and mortar store and they see our case on shelf there, how can they you know, start to resonate with that and resonate with our brand? And so what we've actually done on our cases is there is case art on every single case. So we partner with up and coming artists to create those, those different experiences for each flavor box that we have, which is pretty unique to the beverage industry. Um, but it's also pretty cool when you order it on Amazon and it shows up at your house and it has this, this fun case art on it. And so another piece of that that we've sort of taken a step further is whenever we have, you know, exclusive packs that we do, um, you know, our Metallica partnership, for example, we have a specific Metallica case art that we have in Target today. Um, so those are just kind of, you know, more ways that we can continue to resonate with our shoppers through our packaging. We also have QR codes on, our, on all of our boxes and shoppers can, you know, scan those and, and learn more about our brand and experience our website and, and know, learn more about us. Do you have a favorite case art example? Ooh, that's a good one. I think the Armless Palmer iced tea might be my favorite. It's this fun sort of like, you know, headstone, graveyard type inspired uh, case art. But if you haven't seen that one, go check it out. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite iced teas actually too. I, um, in thinking about that, uh, that ability to grow, the new logo is also a key feature in audience growth. We also know that Gen Z, who's on this chart represented in the gold stars and millennials in the pink circles are far out ahead in terms of the ability of an interesting logo and limited edition packaging to really drive consumer engagement and interest in a new product. So having that, I mean, this also speaks to not just a new brand launch or a new sort of product line like the teas at Liquid Death, but looking at all of the consumer brands that are you know, editing their logos, kind of relaunching a logo. We've seen a lot of that in recent years. And so we ran this survey to understand what was driving that. And there is an enormous amount of power in a refreshed logo or a new logo or that new exclusive packaging to really drive that interest. So I think it's something that like you can kind of intuitively know because we all experience that when we're at the grocery stores ourselves, but also just seeing the data behind it, I think is a, a helpful proof point, especially just in the distance between Gen Z and millennials and all other generations. So keeping up with those younger generations really does require an investment in that you know, novel case art, like, like Natalie was mentioning here. Um, I'd love to hear more specifically, and I'm sure some folks in the room are curious, if we can get a little bit more like technical on how, where some of this growth is coming from. Where are you finding success? Where are you investing right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot of parts of the business that we're continuing to invest in from social to production, like the video we shared with you around the iced teas. Um, but I think the biggest piece of our business is that we focus on from just an ad investment standpoint is gonna be the retail media networks. And so we kind of look at that business as mid to lower portions of the funnel where we can really drive that shopper conversion rate with them when they're in a high intent uh, position to convert on either liquid death or just a beverage in general. And so that's where we spend a lot of time and a lot of our ad dollars is gonna be in that portion of the funnel. And, there's been a lot of learnings throughout that too, you know, just understanding more on the keywords your shoppers are searching, what flavors are they looking for, what's resonating with your brand, are you, um, you know, leveraging a cross category type campaign and bringing them into the funnel. But, you know, as we think about the investment as well, Liquid, at Liquid Death, we try to be really nimble and flexible, and we do a lot of 
crawl, crawl, walk, run type approaches with our, our ad spend. And so when we find a new retail media network or a new opportunity to invest, that's where we you know, look at spending a, a test and learn budget there and really taking those learnings to say, okay, are these meeting our budgets? Or sorry, are these meeting our benchmarks for performance? If they are, let's double down. If they're not, let's pivot and, and look at something else that's maybe working. But a constant conversation that we have is for every dollar we put in, how many dollars are we getting out? And how can we continue to grow the business from that perspective, knowing that every dollar has some sort of ad attributed uh, focus on it? It's helpful to hear that it's not just fun and creative. <laughs> like that's, that's obviously the fun part of the business, but hearing all the data behind it that's going into these decisions is, I, I hope, kind of reassuring for a lot of folks in the room. Um, I know retail media networks are such a hot topic. I'd love to double click on that quickly. Um, can you speak to a little bit about why you think those are, like why you're investing there versus like, you know, uh, Meta, for example, something like that? It's a great question. You know, I think when we think about just sales attribution, it's really hard to get that in in you know, the, the real world, in real life experiences, or even you know, through social, I think there are some ways that you know, we try to measure it through Amazon attribution or through the Amazon affiliate links, where we try to understand, OK, we're running this social campaign. What is that, that attributed sales number? But you know, I think it's really important to understand how much the needle is being moved with every ad investment you make. And so, you know, we still invest in social, we invest in these other avenues, but we, we almost have a, a magnifying glass with these retail media networks to really understand and get really connected with our humans to understand where they're shopping, how they're shopping, and then how we can better meet them where they already are. Makes a lot of sense. So we've heard a lot about sort of the creative direction of the brand. Thank you for sharing more about how you're making these more data-driven decisions as well. I would love to hear about like, how you have been able, like, what do you feel like are some of the more unique ways, you've had a lot of experience in the industry, what is more unique about Liquid Death and how you're able to drive this much growth? Yeah, so I think one of the really unique things about Liquid Death is we're, we're content-led and we're entertainment-led. You know, our goal isn't just to sell water, right? Our goal is to make you laugh. Our goal is to, you know, have a post that maybe goes viral on a social media network and it shows up in your feed and, and you chuckle and it makes your day better, right? And so that's one of the things that we're always focused on. And just a few examples of how we do that are, you know, with the, the you know, grandma energy campaign that we call with our iced teas. On that front, you know, really partnering with different influencers in, you know, believe it or not, there are grandma influencers on Instagram. And so we went out and found them and they actually loved our iced tea and we partnered with them. And that was a really, you know, low lift, low budget way for us to be able to activate that campaign against um, our goals. And so, you know, when we think of entertainment from that way, we look at it from a launch standpoint, but then we've also launched an album on Spotify called Greatest Hates, where we've actually taken all of our negative hater comments, ratings and reviews, you know, feedback on social and meshed all that together into a metal album that you can go find on Spotify. Um, so that was a really fun one for us. <laughs> I can imagine for some of you in the audience that you're thinking that would never fly <laughs> where I work. I cannot imagine um, that you would sort of amplify the haters and have a little bit of fun with that. What, um, what have you learned from working at more like traditional brands that you think that, that more, or from your experience at more traditional brands that you think that people could really adopt from Liquid Death, even if you don't have the kind of culture you're describing where you could get away with creating that Spotify yeah. playlist, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, and you know, we don't have the big media budgets of you know, the CPG brand houses. And so we do have to get creative in how we reach those shoppers. And so we really lean into social as a big one for us and focusing on virality. So that entertainment component of how do we make people laugh? But then also how we portray our, our product in a way, and, and this is a little bit in our brand DNA, but you know, I'm sure we've all been on a date where the person across the table is kind of rattling off all the reasons why they're great, right? And so it's boring. 
you know, to hear there's high alkalinity, oh, it's really pure water, balanced pH, or, you know, blue and white colors, and it's boring. And so we try to make that date or that relationship with our shopper just a bit more exciting to be able to grab their attention. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's something that's true to our DNA, but from an execution standpoint, is able to, um, you know, I think a lot of brands can do that in their own unique way. Absolutely. What's it like when you're launching a new campaign, like the Grandma Tea campaign? Like, what's, what's the, how, how is the office rallying around that? Oh, it's, it's very exciting. Um, you know, we partner with some really cool people out there in their respective industries, you know, whether that's, you know, skate or music or, you know, the Grandma Energy one. It's, it's a really exciting vibe on, around how can we build the holistic customer experience. You know, we get really deep in the details. We try to put ourselves in, in the people's shoes who, who will be purchasing our product. So from that point, you know, all the way down to like the Q&As on our Amazon product pages. If you go check those out, those are pretty funny. And we respond to those in a way that tells our brand story. And so just starting to, you know, continue those sorts of, of things with our um, with our, our humans that are purchasing our products. But yeah, it's, it's a fun vibe. It's, it's super exciting, and our kickoff parties are, or our kickoff meetings are always very, very fun. Um, I also have to ask about the celebrity partnerships. If you haven't seen it, they've worked with Martha Stewart, Tony Hawk, Jalen Green. Those names are probably more relevant to, you know, I'm sure all of you heard a name on that list that was <laughs> relevant to you, I should say. Um, tell me about when those partnerships launch. Like how, I would love to hear about, you know, I know you guys have done some social media takeovers around those partnerships. We'd love to hear more about how that works. Yeah. So when we do a celebrity partnership, um, there's a few different components to it, but one of the things that we really focus on is winning the internet for that day. So instead of just having an evergreen strategy and some people posting about us here and there, us posting here and there, you know, it's like with the, the grandma video, it's like how can we win the internet for a day to try and capture the attention of more people um, throughout their social experience or throughout their, their journey, just throughout their daily lives. So that's definitely a component of it. But then also, when we think about the, the talent and the people that we partner with, you know, we really, Liquid Death is a very unexpected brand, right? We're not, we're not traditional. So we kind of also try to partner with people that are, are like-minded in that unexpectedness. So, you know, when we looked at athletes to partner with, you know, for any sum of money, we could have partnered with any athlete in the world, right? I think any brand could, could probably do that. But when we think about what would work best for Liquid Death, that's when we started to take a step back and say, okay, who's sort of you know, unexpected, untraditional in their own right? And that's where you know, Jalen Green has been a really great partner for us. You know, he had a bit of an untraditional career. He, he you know, didn't go to college. He went straight into the G League, and then he's been a rookie. Um, he went into his rookie year over the last couple of years. He paints his fingernails black. Like he, you know, he resonates with the Liquid Death brand so, so well. So that one was really, really fun for us to activate. And it wasn't just a partnership with Jalen. We actually did a merch collaboration, too, where we did a um, hoop head basketball where it looks like a severed head. And so we did this really fun sort of entertainment comedy type short, short clip where we have Jalen you know, dribbling a severed head down the court. He throws it around with some kids. They throw it into a hoop, and it turns into a basketball. And so that one was a really fun one for us to do. <laughs> And then, you know, I think another word that just encapsulates a lot of who we look for in partners is just legends. I think Tony Hawk, you know, is just a legendary skater in his own right. And so that's another great example with Tony. We actually did a partnership where we drew a vial of his blood. We put it in some red paint, mixed it up, and did an exclusive run of skateboards. And those actually sold out, you know, almost immediately. So that was another hot ticket item. Um, but, you know, doing it in our way with Tony was, was sort of a really fun collaboration. And then I think the last one I want to touch on is just, you know, Travis Barker is also a legend within the music world. And so he was a fun one to partner with. We launched a collaboration with him, Enema of the State, a couple of months ago. And, you know, that, that collaboration, too, our team really saw that as, um, I mean, one, Travis is awesome, and he was really great to work with. So 
that part made it really easy. But then additionally, on with that, you know, it opens up a whole nother audience for us with the pop culture of, you know, Kourtney Kardashian. And so we're, we're hitting on that target audience that we started here with, you know, the m music space, but then also sort of doubling down in the pop culture too. So that's just a little bit of kind of how we think about the celebrities that we work with and how we can all sort of partner together in our, our own unique way. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. The, I love the Travis Barker collaboration. I do want, if anyone was a little confused, Enema of the State was the name of a Blink-182 album, so that didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> Travis was, I believe, the drummer in Blink-182 yep. and is now married to one of the Kardashian sisters. So that was, yes. that was the through line there, if anyone is <laughs> as pop, let's say as pop culture savvy as I am, and I, I just kept up with her, so <laughs> um, thanks for that. Um, I know this is such a, a fascinating brand. I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for any questions that you all have, so we are gonna transition into Q&A. So as you think about those questions, would love um, either if you are comfortable coming up to the microphone in the center so everyone can hear you, or just stand up and project as well as you can while you think about what questions you have for Natalie about her experience at Liquid Death and growing this water brand in a primarily digital space, or for me in terms of consumer data, um, can share with you if you want to keep up with either of us. I've got our socials up on the page, and then if you would like to get more of this kind of data um, from Morning Consult, that QR code will take you to a download link to a uh, recent report um, just more on, uh, on this exact topic on what's growing in both physical retail as well as as e-commerce, but I am going to turn it over to the audience. I think I see some hands starting to move, maybe? So we have 15 minutes for this, so yes, please, because we are recording this, so if we do ask the question, if you ask it into the microphone, then we'll actually have that, um, so that would be super helpful. We have one right here, and if you project, I can repeat it for you. Okay, um, yeah, I want to ask, what, what is your percent breakdown in sales between uh, Amazon and your own website? So, yeah, thank you. So the question was, what is the breakdown between sales via Amazon versus your own uh, direct-to-consumer site? You may not be able to give us really specific numbers, which I think we can uh, understand, but if you can just kind of give us a, a rough sense of uh, knowing that Amazon has been such a key growth partner for you all. Yeah, absolutely. So if you, um, great question, by the way, great to meet you. Um, if you go to our website today, you actually can't buy beverage. So we actually push um, all of our, our humans to purchase from either their local brick and mortar store through a store locator experience, or we, we do link out to like an Amazon sort of experience. So it's kind of a weird comparison for us to give since it, that's our merch business versus, versus our beverage business. But you know, I can say that as far as our, our mix of where people are purchasing beverage, you know, it's gonna be the major dot coms. And then we also do quite, quite a bit of business through the delivery apps. That's been an interesting one for us. So if you think of like Instacart, GoPuff, DoorDash, um, Drizzly, Uber Eats, it's, it's, it's an interesting part of the business that I had never experienced actually in my previous retail consulting. But um, if you are in the CPG Bev food space, check it out, it's been a, it's been a nice one for us. Thank you. Yeah. So the e-com side is strictly merch. Maybe on water our, in one day, maybe not. Maybe <laughs> you can't answer that question. Yeah, on our liquiddeath.com site, it's just, just merch today. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? That was a great one to start us off. One right here. Oh, thank you for coming up. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so I'm Gen Z, so I kind of heard of you guys through a bunch of podcasts, Code to Co, TMG, all of that. Um, when did you really decide to lean into that influencer marketing? and how did you decide who to choose for that? Yeah, it's, oh, did you wanna? No, no okay. go right ahead. Seriously. Awesome, no, it's a great question. And I think, you know, the interesting thing is there's influencers who resonate with Gen Z and there's influencers who resonate with all different sorts of people. And so really as we start to think about those days that we're activating with our Travis Barker launch, with our Jalen Green launch, with our, our you know, Gram Energy launch, we really just try to sort of get everyone on board to focus on that specific target. But I would say, you know, influencers in general, in a way, you know, people have loved posting about Liquid Death since our inception. So it's kind of, you know, core to who we've been for a few years now. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely evolving. And as new influencers come around or new trends or we want to drop a new merge product, we're always looking to see, like, who can tell that story the best for us. Thank you. Yeah. 
I'll just tack on to that. We also do some influencer study on my end, and it's it's not just a Gen Z thing. Like influencers are like like you said, really for everybody. It's just about finding the right influencer for your audience, whether that is a celebrity level influencer or a real micro influencer who just happens to have a really engaged community. That's really where a lot of that um, a lot of that activity comes from, from what we see in our data. Anyone else? One right here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all this with us today. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, you know, again, how are you balancing between the media and, and the partnerships with Celery early mm -hmm. on? Because um, I think that's what a lot of people struggle with is finding that kind of early on kind of balance to, to, to actually spend on the retail sites versus a partnership. And where do you think you're getting more of that attribution? Totally. Yeah, it's definitely a balance of the two for us right now. But a lot of the testing that we did early on, you know, when we did that $5,000 social media test, it, it was you know, hey, let's test and learn this and see what happens. And so I think that same philosophy still holds as we think about trying out new retail media networks or just trying out new ad investments in general is let's not go dump a ton of money and put all our eggs in one basket. Let's, let's test out things uh, at a smaller scale. And if it works, awesome. You know, we've had a couple nuggets earlier this year that you know, we're, we're bigger pieces of the business for us and we didn't realize, but taking a few thousand dollars, running a test and learn, understanding that that could be an opportunity, I think was what has really resonated with us um, over the more recent years. Yeah, I think for me, when Nellie and I have been getting to know each other for this event, just hearing like how much of the business is so creatively driven, but how mm -hmm. at the same time it's so data driven. Yeah, that's a really good point, Claire. So our team is, con especially on the digital side, constantly trying to understand, OK, what are our, you know, what are our impressions? What's our conversion? What's our earned media that we have in our, you know, when we partner with publishers or we partner with different influencers, really starting to, to quantify that in a way, but then also trying to quantify sentiment, sales, spend, understanding what the total attribution is. Um, which can be hard today, right? It's hard to understand a true customer acquisition cost and a true lifetime value. Um, so, you know, modeling that where we can't and trying to get as close to the actuals as possible. Really helpful. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be shy. Oh, one right here. I'm going to repeat that question for the recording. Thank you for asking. It's a great question. So for events, activations, what are the core KPIs? Are we So like the example was um, sponsoring the Metallica tour. What, how are we measuring the success of that? Is it in sales? Is it in eyeballs? Is it all of the above and somewhere in between? Yeah. So I think the thing, you know, with the Metallica tour and us expanding into the UK, it's it's a you know, expansion lever for us. And so going to a new market, you're going to have to do a little bit more of awareness play right than maybe you would within the traditional retail media networks. And so for us, quantifying exactly, I, you know, I think we look at, obviously, cans and hands you know, is one way to kind of quantify it. But then also to just you know, leveraging Amazon attribution tagging wherever we can to understand, OK, someone was served maybe um, this ad around a certain geographical location, um, and maybe they went on to purchase or not. And so I think that's, there's, that's kind of how we start to think about it. But then you know, everything is super nuanced in um, what that follow-on tactic looks like. So we try to get as close as we can to leveraging data, but you know, it's not perfect. <laughs> Anyone else? I actually have a question. Wonderful, so, thank you. I have you. a microphone, so this is perfect. I didn't need to walk <laughs> up there. The, uh, I, I mean, the greatest hates, which I'd heard of on Spotify, I think is so brilliant. But I, I think a, a question that which everyone can deal with is like every brand is going to deal with negative sentiment in some format. Mm -hmm. Like what was that process to take something that was there and then just turn it in? And obviously your brand is amazing, entertainment led. I love that, that phrasing. Um, but yeah, how did you take that negative and then end up turning that and go through all like the approvals to actually get that out as like a super successful marketing campaign? Yeah, no, I mean, I think one of the, one of the beauties of our company, our, our founder and CEO, Mike, he's a creative visionary at the start. So, you know, he, he was on board for that, which was awesome, um, which I know isn't going to be the case for every company. But yeah, it's, it's interesting because as we think, of, I'm sure we all get negative feedback on, you know, our, our different products that we're selling or, you know, every brand experiences that. And oftentimes it's the vocal minority, right? And so, you know, I think 
sometimes you can think of that as, oh my gosh, how do we need to go fix this customer experience to you know, support maybe what would be like 1% of all of your shoppers. And I think instead of that, we almost leaned into it or we over-indexed in it in a way that, hey, you know, this is funny. And again, back to that core of entertainment that's so you know, just in our DNA and core to who we are that, hey, this is a great opportunity to sort of lean into that hate instead of you know, rolling up and crawling up inside a hole and hoping no one ever sees that comment. So yeah, for us, we just made it purely entertainment driven and it, it really hit for us and it's, it was a fun little album to release. <laughs> <laughs> I also think I want to um, connect that back as well to something you said earlier when you were talking about how your team is really active in like the Amazon Q and A and being really responsive mm -hmm. to customers as well. So it's I think that is one really phenomenal and very cheeky tactic to um, counter some of uh, you know some negative sentiment that people might have, but also just being very active where consumers are having conversations about the brand yeah. at that point of purchase. I think is also like that that seems like a like those two strategies go together in a, like a more tactical sense as well as in the more entertainment driven sense. Right, right, right. Anyone else? Right here. So as a disruptor in the industry, inevitably there's going to be um, competitors that are going to try and um, you know, do their own kind of version of the liquid death branding. Um, have you kind of seen that start to happen in the space? And how does the brand kind of see themselves uh, competing against that, that mirrored uh, brand image? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me repeat it quickly. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I just want to make sure that we can get it on the recording. So the question was, um, as a disruptor, Liquid Death is obviously getting a lot of attention, which by necessity means there will be copycats. And how are you combating the copycats? Yeah, so we haven't seen a ton of copycats lately. Although I'm not sure if maybe you guys saw this in your own social feeds, but Guinness kind of looks like Liquid Death, especially our black can. And there was this funny TikTok that actually went viral where a dad accidentally put a Guinness in his kid's lunchbox instead of a Liquid Death. Um, <laughs> that so wasn't you guys? That was not okay. us. That was totally organic. And um, so yeah, that's the only one I can think of that would be like similar. But yeah, I mean, you know, especially with the Amazon being the everything store that it is, that's definitely happened in other categories. I think you know, fortunately for us, no one's really come at it that way. But I do think, you know, the entertainment component behind um, Liquid Death and sort of like the clout that we've built over the years would be hard for someone just to build overnight. Um, and that's thanks to our creative team and our creative geniuses on our team. But yeah, I think we would probably just continue to lean down into our, our entertainment. Yeah. We've got time for a couple more questions, if anyone has any you're sitting on. One in the back here. And one more, sorry. Oh, please. Oh, thank you. Thanks for making the, oh, you don't have to run. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you guys don't have that connection for DTC, um, like how are you maintaining your communication and kind of differentiating communications with your customers? Mm -hmm. uh, because you are doing so much on, you know, the, the, the dot coms that you don't own the yeah. domain. So how are you maintaining those connections? And then data wise, like how are you tracking those uh, consumers outside of maybe the Amazon space? Yeah, I'll start and then yeah, you go can, ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, you know, oftentimes the, the first time a lot of people are seeing us is, is not in a an, in an sort of ecosystem that can be tracked, just like you were saying. So, um, you know, I think today we actually have a pretty active like customer support. People reach out. A lot of people love our brand, you know, so we'll get some pretty cool people that write in and, and talk about that or, you know, we, we can have sort of the one-to-one -one relationships in that sort of aspect. But, you know, we have great relationships with all of our retail partners. Um, so while it's not, you know, exact shopper level data, they, they have been able to give us insights on directionally, whether it's demographic based, psychographic based or anything like that. We also run programmatic campaigns where we can target shoppers of different backgrounds and learn, okay, you know, our shoppers are over-indexing in punk music versus a different type of music, for example. Um, so those are other things that we start to test as well, um, even though we can't get it at like the, the PII level, per se. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that um, my company does 
shameless plug, but we can also track audience data from buyers of brands. Of, we track about 4,000 brands in a daily survey, so we're able to see is favorability growing, is purchasing intent growing, it, it, so looking at like, brand trust, net promoter, able to measure that really closely, so it, we can tie that really cleanly because it is a daily survey to specific market activation. So it might not be from a retail data and it's not sales data, but it is awareness, favorability, um, and purchasing consideration, you can see those needles move um, pretty accurately with um, outside partners as well. And I think one more thing I'll say as a follow-up too is, um, you know, we leverage the Amazon affiliate link tracking. So we, you're essentially, for those of you that aren't familiar, you're able to generate unique uh, URLs to essentially tag different components of your shopper journey or whenever you're trying to drive traffic to Amazon. And so being able to add those links at thoughtful moments where maybe you're sending out a text or you're driving traffic from our D2C over to Amazon and then Amazon can start to help you quantify some of that. Um, that's kind of been really interesting for us to be able to understand what's working and what's not. And even using those for specific campaign level insights has been helpful. I think we've got time for one more. Okay, perfect, right here. The question was, why aren't we selling on their own website versus kicking it to um, e-commerce and brick and mortar? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so today we, we, we just try to rely on the network of you know, what's closest to you. Um, it's probably a brick and mortar store um, that you can use maybe pick up today or delivery from there. And that's probably going to be a better avenue just for fulfillment sake, right? You know. Um, so yeah, we've tried to lean into that more recently. It's not to say things won't change in the future, but just from a fulfillment economic standpoint, it's made more sense for us to leverage, you know, probably the the ton of stores you have within a mile of your home. Right. Or the if you're placing an order on some of the partners you mentioned, GoPuff, Instacart, you can add yeah. that on to an existing trip versus making a single purchase, which is more of a natural consumer behavior and food above. And it's a luxury we've built over time, too, because I understand every direct-to-consumer company doesn't come out with 90,000 doors overnight, right? So it's kind of like all of this hard work that we've done from a distribution standpoint. Like, let's lean into that a bit more than just selling through our site. Awesome. I think that's a great place to wrap us up. So thank you all so much for your time and attention and the fantastic questions. I hope you all got a lot out of this session. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up. <laughs>